My problem states, isopropyl alcohol, a substance sold as rubbing alcohol, is composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Combustion of 0.255 grams of isopropyl alcohol, which is about what we used, produces 0.561 grams of carbon dioxide and 0.306 grams of water. Determine the empirical formula of isopropyl alcohol. So don't let me forget at the end, I wanna to introduce to you a little bit of organic naming. It's different than regular naming. So here's how we do these problems. You're given the quantities of carbon dioxide and water produced when our sample was combusted. Now we're gonna to have to use this information to determine the empirical formula for the compound. I already know what isopropyl alcohol's chemical formula is. You probably don't. But there's going to be cases where you don't know what the hydrocarbon is at all. For example, if you're in chemical research and you're trying to find a new drug, a lot of times it's going to be a hydrocarbon and you want to find something new, something that could potentially cure cancer or something like that. So we would use what's called combustion analysis and we would take advantage of the fact that when you combust a hydrocarbon, carbon dioxide and water are always a product. That's if you give it enough oxygen. We know there's plenty of oxygen in this room, right? Because we're all still breathing. So that chemical reaction had plenty of oxygen. That's why it's called complete combustion. If you hear the concept of incomplete combustion, that means that the reaction did not have enough oxygen. So it's getting to be that time of the year when you drive past fire stations, sometimes you'll see on the uh, billboard in front, it'll say, space heaters need space or it's uh, fire season clean your fireplaces you're supposed to have your fireplaces professionally cleaned every single year because if squirrels make a nest in there you might starve your fire of oxygen and that's when you produce carbon monoxide which is odorless colorless and deadly did you also know you're supposed to have your furnace professionally cleaned every single year and your dryer? Because those are types of combustion reactions that if they don't get enough oxygen, they will be incomplete combustion reactions and they'll produce carbon monoxide. So there's the downside, right? All of our combustion reactions that we are doing all the time at our houses, whether it's cooking food on our stoves or drying clothes in our dryer or taking a hot shower or just turning the heat on like some of us might have done already. Those are all combustion reactions that run the risk of being in a position where they don't have enough oxygen and producing carbon monoxide and water. Okay, but we're gonna assume that all of these are complete combustion reactions. So the first thing we do is recognize that all of the carbon from the hydrocarbon is going to end up in carbon dioxide. All of the hydrogen in the hydrocarbon is going to end up in water. If carbon dioxide is given the option to produce, it will. If hydrogen and oxygen have a chance to come together, they will produce water. In order to get them to do anything else, you have to mess with the reaction. Okay, so here's how we do this. To calculate the number of grams of carbon, first you use the molar mass of carbon dioxide, and then we're gonna pull the carbon out of there. Now, a lot of times when I do these problems, carbon has a mass of 12.01, and carbon dioxide has a mass of 44.01. We can make our problems a lot easier while we're learning and not mess with all those significant figures. So here's how we would do this. In order to calculate the number of grams of carbon, I'm going to use my given, the fact that 5.561 grams of carbon dioxide was produced.
Now the oxygen cannot be directly taken from these quantities, but the carbon can because all the carbon in the hydrocarbon turned into carbon dioxide. So first thing I wanna do is change grams of carbon dioxide to moles of carbon dioxide. Just like we did in gravimetric analysis, I'm now gonna recognize in one mole of carbon dioxide, because the mole ratio for carbon dioxide is always the same, there's one mole of carbon. One mole of carbon has a mass of 12 grams. So of my sample, the part that was carbon was 0.153 grams. The calculation of the number of grams of hydrogen from water is similar, although we have to remember that two hydrogen atoms are in each water molecule. So my given quantity in the problem was 0 0.306 grams of water was produced. I'm going to change that to moles first. And here's the part that you don't want to mess up on. One mole of water has two moles of hydrogen atoms. And the amount of hydrogen produced in this re reaction can be calculated as 0 0.0343 grams. Now we know that the compound contained only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But there was also oxygen as a reactant. So to find out the amount of oxygen, we have to be a little bit clever. So we have to recognize that the sample contained hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. So we get the grams of the sample. We know that only has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. In order to figure out how much oxygen we have, let's subtract off what we calculated as the grams of carbon and also the grams of hydrogen. So we have 0.255 gram sample. We'll subtract off our carbon at 0.153 and our hydrogen at 0 0.0343. And we get a mass of oxygen of 0.068. Now that we have the grams of each of our element, we had to change them to moles first to figure out the grams. Now we have to change them back to moles in order to be able to compare them. So the moles of carbon are going to be, let's list our grams first. 0.153 grams of carbon were produced. 0 0.0343 grams of hydrogen were produced and 0 0.068 grams of oxygen were produced. I'm gonna change them to moles by dividing by the molar mass. Once I have them in moles, then I can compare them to each other. So I have 0 0.0128 moles of carbon, 
three, four, zero moles of hydrogen and point zero, zero, four, three moles of oxygen. Now that I have them in moles, I can compare them. And remember in chemistry class, we compare by dividing. So you find the number that's the smallest. Obviously, oxygen is the smallest. So this is the value that we're going to divide the others by. Obviously, if you divide anything by itself, you get one. So that means the subscript for oxygen is going to be one. The subscript for hydrogen will be, and I'm going to put the close enough symbol there, eight, and for carbon is three. So the empirical formula for isopropyl alcohol is C3 H8 O. Now I knew that. Let's write this word down here and I'm going to show you what these word letters mean. So whenever it says alcohol, that means it has an alcohol functional group. That functional group is an OH. So there's an OH somewhere. Propyl means that there's three carbons. So there's some prefixes in organic chemistry that you'll need to know to uh, name compounds. Anything that starts with METH is one. ETH is two. PROP is three. BUT is four. PENT is five. PEX is six. Hept is seven, oct is obviously eight, and it goes on from there. So that means that methane has one carbon. Ethane has two carbons. Propane has three carbons. Butane has four carbons. Now the iso means that the functional group of the alcohol is in the middle. So iso means same. What ISO means when it comes to propyl, it's a little bit of a common name. It means that both sides of the molecule look the same. So carbon, carbon, carbon. Propanol would have the uh, uh, alcohol group or the OH at the end of it. Isopropyl alcohol has the alcohol group here. I know that. When it comes to hydrocarbons, carbon wants to have four bonds. In this case, each carbon has four single bonds. There are some things that indicate to you whether they're single or double or triple bonds, but we'll learn that later. So I know that the car carbons each have four bonds and each of the missing atoms here will be a hydrogen, like such. So that is the structure of isopropyl alcohol. Let's balance this reaction. So it was written as C3H8O. That's kind of an inorganic chemistry way to write it. It's perfectly fine. We know that we reacted it with O2, plenty of O2, so it was complete combustion. <clears throat> and we got carbon dioxide and water. To have the coefficient of one by the hydrocarbon. The reason that we do this is because the definition of combustion of hydrocarbon is combustion of one mole, because you can look up the enthalpy or the energy that is released from this reaction, and it will always be the quantity per one mole. So that's the standard. 
So when I'm balancing this, I'm going to first balance carbon every single time. Believe it or not, when you balance with the option of using fractions, it's actually easier than balance without the option of using fractions. Because I'm going to go ahead and balance my carbons and my hydrogens, and I don't have to change the coefficient for isopropyl alcohol from one. But now I need to recognize I have 10 oxygens on the product side. I have three on the reactant side, but this is going to remain the same. That's not going to change, right? So now I need to have this O2 somehow give me nine oxygens. So I'm going to say, what can I multiply O2 by? to give me nine oxygens, and that will be the balanced reaction. And because it's a combustion reaction, heat is always released. What do we call a chemical reaction that releases heat? Exothermic. It's exothermic. All combustion reactions are exothermic. 